Hello, and welcome to the Weekly Scroll Podcast brought to you by the Adventure Archive. My name is Ryan, and we have more guests than we've ever had before here uh, to talk about Black God's Kiss. We have uh, Jonica Stuckey, Max Moon, and Peter Biebergall. Um, How are all of you? I'm doing great. Yeah, how are you? I'm good. I'm getting tired, but I'm tired on every episode. So um, uh, we talked about Peter. Did I say, did I get it right? Oh, perfect. Perfect. So uh, so why don't all of you tell me a little bit about yourselves so that anyone watching um, kind of knows a little bit more about you. So, uh, Jonica, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. So um, my name's Jonica. I'm, I'm based in Boston, and... Um, I'm sort of whatever you want to call it, the, the publisher or the creator of Blazing Worlds, which is the publisher for Black God's Kiss. Um, I, uh, I actually, I've been in literary publishing for almost 20 years now, um, but over the pandemic, first as sort of like a hobby, um, I got into um, writing and publishing some RPG content and then I was like, wow, this is really fun. And um, there's way more people who want to read this than like the poetry books that I've been publishing. So um, I'm still uh, still doing literary publishing and, and love that, but spun up Blazing Worlds and branched out. So Black Got, we did Ekphrastic Beasts a couple of years ago, um, which, yeah, awesome. We, we can talk about that uh, later on if you want. Um, and uh, and Black God's Kiss is our second Kickstarter project. So. Gotcha. And uh, and Peter, I just I just want to say as an aside that um, Jonica's poetry press is no slouch. I mean, it's award winning sure. poet. <laughs> it is an, it is an award winning so poetry. Yeah, I just don't want to be like, oh, it's a little thing he does. Yeah, you know, that's fair. I, at, I was at Kinko's, yeah. you know, putting out some, you know, yeah. Yeah, so uh, uh, just to, uh, to acknowledge that we've been we've been publishing poetry books for twenty years. It's won a number of very prestigious awards, um, and I'm also a poet in my own right. I don't publish my own uh, writing. I, I was actually the first uh, single author book to be published by Jack White's uh, publishing company called Third Man Books, um, and I have I have two collections of my own poetry out with Third Man Books and have done some like tours sponsored by Atlas Obscura and stuff like that. So that's that's the literary realm. And that's how I, that's the angle from which I came into doing uh, tabletop role-playing games is I wanted to do, I wanted to publish games that were very like artist centric and that brought in talent um, from other disciplines and other genres. So when we did Ekphrastic Beasts, uh, I, I'm the writer, uh, you know, I'm a, a, an award-winning poet writing this uh, monster manual. And then I brought in these illustrators who are like fine art illustrators, tattoo artists, people like that. All of them, let's see, there were six of them. Arik Roper and Skinner were the only ones who had previous TTRPG illustrating experience. The other four came from other disciplines. So that's really was the conceit behind Blazing Worlds is I wanted to bring in like writers, scholars, fine artists, and have it really be an artist-driven games publishing studio um, rather than it be just about like we're sort of like a factory for content. Um, and yet when we get to talk about a cracked beast, we'll definitely talk about that because the art in it is, it's amazing. Thank you. So man. yeah, excited to talk about and that. We should, and we should give a, we, we'll talk more about it, but we give a shout out to your background and my <laughs> background, which is uh, by Saprofial. Um, and she's the artist for Black God's Kiss. And also her work is just incredible. You can't probably tell from these backgrounds but the line work is just phenomenal and she puts in like over 80 hours of inking into each piece and yeah it's gorgeous it's stunning yeah we'll definitely we'll definitely talk about it um a little bit more here as well um and then peter so i am a writer author critic i have a couple of books mostly about um the intersection of religion and pop culture. Very interested in a culture is sort of a term people use. And so a couple of my books, Season of the Witch was about 
sorts of occult influences on the history and trajectory of rock and roll. And most recently, a book called Strange Frequencies, which is a book about the intersection of technology and the supernatural and, and occult practices. And, you know, just various writing reviews for uh, various uh, web and print outlets over the years. I've been playing role playing games since probably 78. I think I bought my my brother actually bought me the basic set in like 78 at the complete strategist in Fort Lauderdale, uh, Florida. So I uh, added, you know, that just being a part of that game shop. I stopped playing for a while for, you know, sex, drugs and rock and roll sort of distracted me for many, <laughs> for many years, uh, but got back into playing probably about 20 years ago and have had pretty consistent groups since then. And, you know, that's, I mean, what can I say? Role playing games, the culture around them, particularly 1970s culture is sort of the DNA of my imagination and the way I think about things and the things that I love. And last, uh, right around, right before the pandemic, I had proposed to do this anthology called Appendix N, which is essentially drawing from Gary Gygax's list, which is infamously known as Appendix N uh, from the original uh, advanced uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, Dungeon Master's Guide. And so we can talk about sort of how that partly led to, you know, this project, but essentially that um, has sort of elevated for me my interest in maybe doing more work around RPGs. And I actually, um, we are just about to turn in the final draft uh, this fellow, J.F. Martell, who's best known for his podcast, Weird Studies. We're about to turn in a final draft for a Call of Cthulhu campaign we wrote for Chaosium. And that should be out next year. Um, so I was very excited when uh, Jonica approached me to work on a project together uh, to just keep sort of moving in this domain of, um, of RPG writing and, and development. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. The pandemic was clearly like an awful thing that is still going on right now, and I hate to, I'm not even going to use that word. Period. Um, a lot of creatives with the time and stress and and everything that came from it, um, a number of projects and things have kind of blossomed from this. You know, it's kind of it's almost I don't want to say even silver lining, um, of the pandemic. Um, and it's really interesting how a lot of projects have been brought together and started and and um we're the impetus for a lot of things so it's you know it's it's interesting i'll say that's that's the best way i can describe yeah. it yeah. yeah if we get it um, back to a drastic beast uh, it was very specifically a pandemic project but mm -hmm. let's go to max and if we get back to it yeah i was gonna say max <laughs> max we uh we've we've met once or twice we've chatted a couple of times yeah. very good friend of the show max uh for those that haven't listened to all the times you've been on yeah tell us a little bit about yourself sure yeah um, I'm Max Moon. Um, I make uh, zines, specifically TTRPG zines. Uh, I do game design and writing and a uh, little bit of illustration here and there. And, um, you know, similar to uh, along this, like the lines of this conversation, I started this all up at the during the pandemic. I was actually kind of going going back to getting deeper into printmaking before the pandemic hit. And then once that happened, I'd also been playing a lot more uh, role-playing games, kind of picking that back up um, at a way, way more intensive pace, like actually playing every week again after maybe like a year or so off. Um, and then as I was doing printmaking and stuff, I was like getting really interested in doing prints around um, fantasy illustration and stuff like that. But then once the pandemic hit, I was just like, uh, this is the time I've been wanting to make things. And um, I made zines a long, long time ago. Uh, and I've noticed that I just have gotten better at everything from just getting older. Uh, I was talking to Peter about this with circuit bending the other day, actually. Uh, but it's like, 
even without practicing sometimes I just just being older I am like I guess I'm more patient and a little more thoughtful than I was um so I just hit hard making uh, role-playing game stuff and scenes in particular, and I love making things with my hands. Also, that has come to the point where anyone who's bought stuff from me now probably has heard me complain about <laughs> hand pains and swelling and I had having to take breaks and stuff. But it's a, um, just a beautiful experience for me to create objects, create content, and all the wonderful people I get to collaborate with along the way, um, which on that note, I was very excited about working on Black God's Kiss for a few reasons. Um, one, Jonica's work with the Crastic Beast, I was really excited about conceptually, but when he sent me a copy, I actually like read it. I was just like, this is just such gorgeous writing. The art is beautiful. And a lot of times when I'm reading RPG books, I'm not having like this experience with the writing where I could just sit and read and just be like, feel like it's it's moving, right? So that, that drew me in really intensely. Um, also, uh, Peter's Appendix in uh, collection was wonderful and hearing that I get to work with Peter was fantastic. And that one of the things I appreciated about that Appendix in collection was the inclusion of things like CL Moore. Um, so it was just like uh, opportunity to work with some incredible folks who I really admire and Sopropyl's art is just mind boggling. Um, so yeah, I was very honored to be invited to join in on that team. Yeah, you, I mean, it's a stacked team. You guys are all like <laughs> fantastic. So this is, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's nice, I guess, coming from already being in the industry, whether it's like an adjacent part of the industry or not. Like, I assume you already had, you know, your foot in a number of doors, Jonica, to be able to kind of transition a little bit more in within publishing um, to switch over. Do you feel like that was, um, uh, do you feel like that's true that like having already uh, decades of experience in publishing, it, it was a little bit easier to, to switch into teach RPG? Um I th I think it was insofar as just publishing experience goes, you know, like I knew how to um, spec, uh, you know, and quote print jobs. So like there, and that's a steep learning curve for anyone who hasn't done that before, like how to source a printer, how to get competitive pricing, how to spec a job so that you can create something that is like a, a physically uh satisfying and beautiful object but that is also you know like <clears throat> affordable to produce and like you can offer it to the public at an affordable price point so it definitely helped me and obviously layout and design because a number of the awards that my press has won have actually been for design not just for content so like um i think all of that helped and at the same time um it, it's a totally different beast like doing doing rpg uh writing and publishing and obviously it's it's way more graphics intensive for the layout than anything you would do for a book of fiction or poetry um and finding the audience you know that was something when we did ekphrastic beasts because none of us came from the world of ttrpgs we were like we're gonna do this kickstarter and i don't even know like maybe we'll get funded by day 30 hopefully like and um and we got funded in like 72 hours and then we had to like think of all these stretch goals because we hadn't anticipated we weren't even sure if we were going to get funded at all um so there there were and, and i think the audience for ttrpgs is very different i mean obviously um from literary audiences although i think there's a strong overlap there but what they're looking for, what they're interested in, the type of information they want to make informed decisions uh, before they buy a book is something that like I had to learn and I'm still learning. So um, that's been different for sure. Now what, I know you guys talked about this a little bit, but the how did all three of you guys actually come together? Was it mostly Jonica? Was it you reaching out to everybody? Um, did you guys yeah. knew each other for a long time prior? Or? I think Max and I knew each other on some weird astral plane, but had never met. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. yeah. So Peter and I have known each other for, I, I don't know how long, seven years, something like eight I years? Longer than that. Ten, ten years? Yeah, yeah ten so, years. a long time. Um, Peter, uh, we met 
uh, I think it just because we were like traveling in the same sort of literary occult uh, RPG circles in Boston. Um, and then and then I joined a, a gaming group where Peter was the DM and and we became closer friends that way. So I've known Peter for a long time. He's the godfather to my son. <laughs> so um, and the, and then the way we um, got involved together on this project was because I read C.L. Moore's work in Black God's Kiss for the first time in Peter's book Appendix N. And, and it really just like it, it stuck with me. I was reading I was reading Appendix N while I was wrapping up Ecrastic Beasts. And Black God's Kiss in particular like the imagery and the atmosphere just like haunted my imagination for months and months. And I finally, I just reached out to Peter. I was like, you think that we could adapt this in some way for like a role-playing game? Uh, and Peter reached out to see how more as a state and one thing left to another. And so we ended up licensing the work. And I think Peter, you had already started working on that Chaosium uh, adventure at that point. Yeah. So then that's when I had the idea of like, well, do you want to co-write the RPG material with me? Um, and then somewhere concurrently, like in a parallel timeline, uh, <laughs> um, Max's partner uh, was trying to like, I think had made multiple attempts to introduce Max and I. So Max's partner um, went to high school with my wife um, and was like, you guys have like a ton in common and you should just know each other. And at least on my end, I had been aware of Max's gaming material, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that <laughs> like I didn't make the connection. So when when Jess was like, here, here's Max's email, here's a link to their work and everything, then I was just like, oh shit, yeah. So then we just started corresponding and we sent each other some gaming materials and some some letters and stuff like that. And um and one of the one of the materials that Max sent me was um was like a standalone like micro game and i thought this is really cool i would love to have a gameplay element in black god's kiss that is like this so then i asked max about about writing something like that i mean it feels very faded a bit i mean the fact that you moved into rpg space and then had this connection to someone who's amazing in the rpg space and does you know zines and design and all that kind of stuff it right. really sounds like it worked out well yeah, yeah, yeah. Both that we all have the we all have that background in, in RPG interests and experience in various ways, and then also like in our own ways are also occult practitioners too, which was a like a strong bond between all three of us. In different, di I think it, it manifests for us in different ways and in different disciplines, but like have that overlapping experience, which um, I think also informs the type of gaming experience that we're designing for Black God's Kiss. I think it's about like a conscious attempt to just live in the weird. Yeah. Sort of a way to I think describe it, at least for myself, but I think that there's a general sensibility that that Angelica that you've been able to pull in with all the creators, I mean, you know, um, immediately feeling that connection to, to everybody that's involved in this project. Yeah. Yeah. That was something, you know, that I learned on working on Ekphrastic Beasts was of course there are like hundreds or thousands of really talented, amazing illustrators out there. Um, but when you're going to work on a project together, it, talent alone isn't enough. Like you want that person to be someone you enjoy working with, that you're going to be in multiple meetings with, that feels like they're contributing to a team and want to be involved that way. And we were lucky on Ekphrastic Beasts. Uh, actually, I don't want to say lucky. We, we went into it with that in mind and and jeremy hush who um is one of the illustrators there and who runs a gallery out of philly he he helped hand pick the illustrators and was like this person's a rad person this person's a rad person like so we ended up with this really great team and you know that project has been done for two years now and i'm still on like a group text thread with all the illustrators where we're just like chatting and stuff like that so when 
uh, I was pulling together the team for Black God's Kiss. That was something I also kept in mind was like, that was such a great experience. And I want to, I want to have a similar experience with Black God's Kiss. So, it, you know, like it wasn't just, these are great, these are like great thinkers or writers or illustrators or designers, but like, uh, these are people who, you know, I do like kind of like a Zoom interview with first and like see whether we kind of click and uh, and if they feel like they're going to be someone who's like fun and interesting to work with. So, and that's and, what that call was. What's that? <laughs> so, that's, so that's what that call was. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, that was a yeah, yeah, uh, secret interview. <laughs> So, so we're definitely going to get into Black God's Kiss, but we've talked about this a number of times. Um, it's a cryptic yeah. beast, um, and so I have the. This is the limited version, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, here on for those in podcast land, it's a, it's a gorgeous book, all black with this gold uh, logo on the front. Um, so when I I uh, I actually saw this on Kickstarter, and I'll be completely honest, I was like, ah, five E, I'm not backing it. Um, yeah. and that was, that was my first, it was pretty much like a glance and a move on. And then obviously, you know, myself and Max are good friends. Um, when we started talking about this, um, it might've even been before we talked about this, he had brought up a fractic beast. Um, and I actually went to the website and really looked at it and it's, I mean, that's, that was a mistake on my part, not to back it originally. It's a gorgeous, not only is it a gorgeous book, but like Max said, it's, it's incredibly well written. Um, and as far as bestiaries go, I can honestly say I've never seen a better one, especially for fifth edition. Um, not only in the stats and the way that they're written, but the writing for every creature. But as you said, like it's a very artist heavy book. Every single creature has a full page, like just stunningly gorgeous piece of art in a number of different styles. Um, and I can't recommend this enough for anybody, especially who likes the I guess weirder, like kind of um, I guess more occult side of of uh, Dungeons and Dragons and Fifth Edition. Um, it's it's essential, I guess. Uh, I would say for running um, Fifth Edition for having something that's not in the modules. Um, and, and and again, we've talked about this a little bit about bringing the project together and doing all those kind of things. As your first foray into TTRPG publishing. Um, what was fifth edition, just what was out at the time or like what made you do it in that? And then what yeah. was the impetus after this? Yeah. So it was a couple of reasons. Um, I was playing uh, fifth edition at the time that we launched it. So I was like, this is the, this is the rule set that's like fresh in my mind. And I had been, I was in the middle of like, uh, probably it was like a five year campaign or something like that. So it was really like etched in my mind. Um, <clears throat> so that was one reason, uh, because I, yeah, I wrote all the, the, the lore, which, which appear, you know, manifests in the book basically as like flash fiction or like little mythologies that are like 200 to 300 words. Um, but I was also statting all the creatures. So like to do the game mechanics, I wanted to just, I didn't want, you know, just wanted to use a, a system that was like fresh in my mind, but also, um, you know, because Blazing Worlds didn't exist, like I was not known in the RPG space, not I, most of the illustrators weren't. We wanted to just create something that was going to be like pretty accessible to people and um, not, and so just picking like the most popular system for our first project was something that kind of made sense for us. Um, that said, uh, we have been like thinking about reskinning it for some other systems. So I've been talking with Max and uh, and another actually a cult RPG writer out of the UK, Phil Lagarde, who's done um, some Mork Borg stuff and Max has done some Mork Borg stuff. And, uh, and I think aesthetically, Ekphrastic Beast is very aligned with the Mork Borg aesthetic. So we've been talking about doing a Morktastic Beasts, um, which is basically, the, it's basically that book, but just like the stat blocks are swapped out for Mork Borg uh, stuff. Um, and then maybe doing, uh, 
now that you know i think with black god's kiss we're building uh, a pretty decent audience for um old school systems so maybe we would also do some sort of old school reskin for it too i don't know depending on how much enthusiasm there is for it whether we would like release it in that like linen gold foil edition if we could get enough i don't know maybe we would kickstart it or something if we could get enough people i'm happy to do that but we might just kind of do a lower lower bar of entry and just say like we're putting it out as a regular hardcover or a paperback. Well, I, I mean, Merkborg is still, you know, huge in in the scene. And I mean, as your first project uh, to publish, like Fractic Beast, looking at the Kickstarter page, 1175 backers and almost $60,000 is not a bad first Kickstarter project. So I think <laughs> right, there is a right. little bit of an audience for for that. And like you said, I mean, I, I in a heartbeat, I would snatch that up, especially um, because uh, to be completely honest, this does feel much closer to that style of game than fifth edition. I mean, fifth edition is pretty much, you know, Tolkien esque, you know, Western, you know, European fiction, um, and this is obviously like incredibly like occult overtones on the entire book. So um, yeah. this would drop right into Markborg really, really easily, um, and that'd be fantastic. And that um, is now with Black Eyed's Kiss you decided to go with OSE on top of 5e. Did any yeah. part of this and those thoughts, you know, kind of uh, encourage that kind of stretch away from, from 5th edition? Definitely. Um, I think for a couple of reasons. One is, um, I sort of, I'm, I'm currently playing, uh, as I was mentioning actually before we started, I'm currently playing uh, Spelljammer reskin for 5e that we started homebrewing before Wizards released 5e. But um, it feels like that setting feels like the natural, like late stage 5e game setting of like, it's like 5e is so high magic and so like almost like naturally overpowered in terms of like the character progression and everything that like, yeah, like wizards in space like that's a that like it gets as wild and zany and crazy and like magic driven spaceships as you can get and uh and i'm enjoying it like we're having a really silly fun time and at the same time like i'm playing a a, a rogue fighter in that game and i was like i'm getting to a certain character level where it's almost impossible to choose a class that doesn't have magic like magical powers, like even as a fighter. Um, and so I started feeling like I really like craving a more like pared down, lethal, <laughs> like um, darker, low magic setting. Um, and so was getting more interested in playing like a more old school system. And then, and then as sort of the artistic vision for Black God's Kiss started coming together in the pre-planning phases, I felt like this would be a great opportunity to do something for OSC. Uh, it feels much more, I think, spiritually aligned with OSC than it does with 5e. And we try to talk about that on the Kickstarter page, you know, because the campaign's live right now. It's like, we're making this compat compatible for both 5e and osc and we can talk more about that in a minute but if you are like uh you know like a tried and true 5e player like this is going to be a different experience for you as a, as a fifth edition player um and so like get ready <laughs> for that yeah. i think i think for osc players it's going to feel like a pretty natural fit but for 5e players it's going to be like Oh shit! Like my character could die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and actually die. Um, and but Peter, um, we uh, uh, I think Jonica said, and tell me if I'm mistaken. Appendix N, your writing was kind of the impetus for the whole idea of using CL more and everything like that. Um, as far as Appendix N, um, what was your I guess reason for writing that? Um, and then with between you and Jonica, like, what was kind of the conversation after reading it and being like, oh shit, CL more. Um, and then yeah. with the licensing and coming to that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so just to be, so I, I, I mean, writing is a strong word. I, it's a, it's the longest book I've ever had my name on, but I only have like about 3000 words in it, you know, <laughs> cause it's, a, cause it's an Those anthology. 3000 great words. Though, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've had this idea for a long time, and I'm mean, surprised nobody else had done it, which was just to try to extrapolate from Appendix N an anthology of stories. Um, it ended up being harder than I thought for a couple of reasons. One, you know, it, it, there's a lot of novels mentioned by name in Guy Gax's list, and I, I didn't want to have a book of um, excerpts. Like, that's not interesting for anybody to read. So I felt like I had to excavate a little bit more, and I've been there's certainly been some critique of my anthology that I went too far outside the bounds of Appendix N. I don't believe that that's true, except we could talk about the things that every author on in in the anthology is in Appendix N in some form. It might be that they show up in the Swords Against Darkness um anthology that guy gack cites which is they're all which is an amazing series although weirdly he only cites volume three and not volume one and two i think what's really important though for me is is that guy gax does say this list and others not included <laughs> are part of my thinking about this game you know but there were two omissions from Appendix N, from Gygax's Appendix N, that I, I mean, maybe then it was really my own making it, you know, I mean, we talk a lot about your own Appendix N, like what's your Appendix N? And, but the two omissions that I felt Gygax must have read and for whatever reason are in that and other authors, you know, note that he makes would have to be Clark Ashton Smith um, and C.L. Moore. Two of the single most, next to Lovecraft and Howard, I think, two most influential writers of that era of weird fiction. In that particular space, you know, obviously you have things that fall outside of that space. Um, but in terms of sort of those playing inside a particular sensibility, which I think in many ways Lovecraft helped kind of develop. But I think, I think in some ways C.L. Moore is an, is, it could easily, the Black God's Kiss could easily be called a Lovecraftian story, you know? And in fact, does more of that work, I think, than maybe sometimes Lovecraft himself does, you know, in that regard. So it was, I felt it was really important to have her, to have her in there. And also because look, you know, and I've also been criticized for this um, in some camps that this was just, even having somebody like C.L. Moore and there was just an attempt to, um, an attempt at woke, waking Guy Gax's appendix end, you know, exactly. So, um, but I, I think that it, it, it seems to me not a stretch to think that C.L. Moore was read by Guy Gax, that Jarell of Jory was certainly, you know, a character that he would have been familiar with, is part of his overall thinking. Not every author he thought about is named in that list. Interestingly, C.L. Moore shows up in the basic edition, you know, the, uh, the red box edition of that, it's not called Appendix N, it's called Education, you know, re, I forgot what the name of that, of that's called, um, list. She shows up there then there's no other Appendix N type thing until 5th edition. So we get all those other editions all through 2, 3, and 3.5 and 4 do not have Appendix Ns. And then 5th edition does one, but they omit her again. Um, so this was also, I felt like, my way of saying... I don't... Whether you think she belongs... Belo you know, whether you think Guy Gax meant to have her in this or not. I'm insisting that she needs to be a part <laughs> of this thinking of Dungeons and Dragons and the world in which it, the world in which it evolves from in terms of literature and fiction. Yeah. And, um, and she, I mean, she has sort of like, 
fallen into the background compared to some of her contemporaries. But I think it's important to keep in mind that in the in the early part of the 20th century, like when when her stories first started coming out in the 30s and and all the way into the 50s, like she was she had a like a pretty big fan base and Black God's Kiss was on the cover of Weird Tales in 1934, or I think it was 34 when it came out. And the, and Weird Tales, the magazine Weird Tales, <laughs> called it the weirdest story ever told. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and she really was part of that vanguard of cosmic horror in African Kardashians. Yeah. Yeah. It's... I mean, so I, again, I, I'm going to be honest, I had never read any CL Moore. I had heard of her, um, but never read any prior to this project. Max reached out to me and talked to me a little bit about it. And then, you know, I got a lot of the details from you guys. So I, so I bought Black Hat's Kiss. And actually this one comes with like, like almost uh, like a lot of her stories, if not all, like it's, it's, um, is it all, is it all Jarell stories or is it? it yeah. So, so it's Black Hat's Kiss, Black Hat's Shadow, Jarell Meets Magic, The Dark Land, Hell's Guard, and Quest of the Starstone with Henry Kuttner. So yeah, the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, and it's wow. Like, I wish I would have read this like eight times already. It's so <laughs> good. And it's just weird because it does feel very kind of Lovecraftian, you know, the world. I mean, she doesn't use the word cyclopean 80 times, so it's not quite Lovecraft, but um, uh, she, uh, it's, but it's this kind of weird mix of, it's demonic, which Lovecraft doesn't really talk about too much demonic stuff, and it is hell, but it's weird, so it's not quite as, as, I don't know, I guess cosmic horror as it feels Lovecraft does. I feel like there's a very specific vibe, yeah. but it's almost as if Lovecraft and there's like sword and sorcery, obviously kind of like melded into this weird space. Um, but I think that's what makes actually... it more hell, actually. More yeah. weird, more Lovecraftian is that I don't think it is hell. I think she thinks it's going to be hell and right. it's not at all. Right, right. It is some, and so there's a sense of saying what you thought was your religious mythology is actually nothing compared to the right. true reality of, which it's, is Lovecraft's sort yeah. of point also, right, right ultimately. Jarell is, Jarell is encountering these other worlds through the lens of medieval Catholic French uh, culture, and then trying to make sense of these other worlds. So like, she's first interpreting it through that lens of French Catholicism and then realizing like this, these are other dimensions. These are wizards. These are magics. These are other worlds that don't yeah. fit that like religious paradigm. She's like, where are all the cloven hoofed winged <laughs> right. devils? Yeah. I don't understand. So yeah. why is there stars here? Why? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, one of the things that struck me too, because, you know, they do say, you know, sword and sorcery or, or whatever, is there's very little actual violence across the both stories. You know, it really, yeah. it's just the little, the little creatures that jump at her legs. There's the tree that she slices like one branch from some things that lash at her a little bit, but there's no like battles. There's no, there's no sword fights. There's no really anything, you know, it's more the, the hardest battles across both stories are in her mind as she's trying to be like like overcome by the black god which i thought was just interesting and different like it, it, it's a different story than i expected when i went into it and and it is much more lovecraftian and cosmic horror than than i expected and it's amazing and i can instantly see how this can be just an open door to tabletop role-playing game settings. I mean, you can run, you can go through the thing, come out of the cave and run in any different direction and have it be another little setting or another little adventure, oh. you know, and, and I can Quick, immediately Jonica, see... Take notes. <laughs> <laughs> so exactly well, what, uh... <laughs> right? Well, and the other interesting thing, too, is if you, you know, especially Max, we've talked about Abyss of Hallucinations a bunch of times. Um, uh, this feels right for that kind of vibe and setting. Like, it, it's, was this at all an inspiration for some of Abyss of Hallucinations? Or is it just a really good max or match with your kind of style with that into this kind of uh, realm? I think it's just because I... I think it's just a really good match in terms of what I love about old school play. Um, in terms of 
with Abyss of Hallucinations, I hadn't read this yet. So I also, I encountered this through uh, Peter's Appendix N and working on this project and it's been um, beautiful. But one of the things I, I just love and I try to keep at is I love low combat role-playing. Um, I enjoy combat, but it's so easy for the combat to kind of overtake and it, fighting something is not always the most interesting thing. I love running away from things, not because I want to just run away, but I love that tension where one of the ways to resolve that, it pushes you to that place where you think you are going to die. And if you run away, that feels successful. If you feel good about having ran away from something and that makes you feel like a win, then I, that's probably a game I'm enjoying. So I think that's something I really loved about this too, just in thinking about the style and how it can translate into like the micro games. Like, there's some combat, but just like in everything I'm, I'm working on, I'm trying to keep things very interesting and engaging and low combat. So. Yeah, and it's actually... It's an interesting love... point, though, to... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. No, go ahead, Peter. I was going to say, in terms of transitioning a little bit to think about why OSC, I want to say two things about that. I think OSC does provide a game... Uh, 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 you know, a, a game conditions that allow more for running away, you know, built into the game. <clears throat> I also think what's really fascinating is of all the OSR material that's been out over the last 20 years or so, BX has become the thing most ported and now popular with OSC than first edition. And I think that there's an elegant, you know, we talk about the OSR as being about, um, you know, being less crunchy, but first edition's very crunchy, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, but, but BX is this flavor of game that really allows you, I think, this kind of play, Max, you're talking about, and I think it really does show that pendulum of, at least in terms of fantasy role players, not, you know, there's a whole other, right, thing we talk about horror and things like that, but fantasy role players where it seems like 5e and OSC seem to be the two, I think, most popular, and I could be wrong, but if you look at the OSC Kickstarter success, yeah. it's pretty telling, you know? Um, and so I think that, yes, Appendix N and Black God's Kiss shows up in I mean, Black Appendix N, where Black God's Kiss is in, is hidden, <laughs> shows up in first edition. But I think, but BX is still the original BX was still part of that whole gestalt of thinking about fantasy and the world, and it's it's just another way of, of entering into that kind of play. Um, so I think in some ways. Having OSC and 5e for any role players in any thing that you're going to produce in, in a fantasy RPG right now does give you access to both kinds of players right now. Yeah. More so than people that are playing Osric or people that are going back to f first edition or, you know, um, so anyways. And and I think uh, I'm glad you brought that up, Ryan, about the the actual like low level of physical violence in those stories because the entire time Jarell's walking around with this like you know long sword right <laughs> that she's like ready to use and she's got a dagger in her boot and everything but that uh, but it, it but it comes down to essentially like um psychic warfare uh in a sense of not not psychic warfare where you think of i don't know like Big Trouble in Middle China. I think of that like penultimate scene, or right. or psionics, or anything. Or psionics, yeah, I was going right. to say. Yeah. But 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 like a really like an ontological struggle for identity. And when I read Black God's Shadow, which is the sequel to Black God's Kiss, there's there are a couple of times where she basically comes head to head with with the Black God, where the Black God's trying to like uh, like possess her soul, basically. And it reminded me of like being like pulling your being either on the precipice of or like descending into a bad trip and then everything you do 
uh, the struggle you have to like reestablish your sense of self and your identity and pull yourself out of that. It was like that experience mapped into like a fantasy <laughs> fiction story. Um, and so we've uh, worked uh, to kind of translate that ethos in an RPG setting and in the and in the standalone micro game in different ways. Um, in the in the RPG setting, part of it is uh, like I said, like making it very perilous so that you are kind of like like really pushing players to not just always try to muscle through things. Um, but Peter and I have also been talking about like uh, special rules and rule sets and game mechanics that are particular to this setting that we can introduce that either like level the playing field a little bit or make players rely more on like charisma and wisdom which are often dump stats unless you're uh, a divine caster or something like that um and 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 but but i think in the micro game and people ask like well why are you doing all these systems in the micro game all in one box and I think the micro game allowed Max to really highlight those themes and that struggle in a way that is hard to do uh, very like concisely or explicitly in the RPG setting. So I'd love if I'd love it if Max, if you wanted to talk a little bit. More about that. Sure. Yeah. I that's something that's just so so exciting about working on this because that element of that like psychic warfare, but like that that tension, the interrelational uh, tension between the Black God and Jarell is something that I'm really having a fun time trying to create a game that pits two players against each other in a way where they're really like, you're wondering what the other person is thinking. And they are trying to create that tension between those two players. Um, so there's the combat side in the game that will happen um you know to you know that'll that'll show up but the ultimately the, the thing is really about um if you've got someone taking on the role of black god and someone taking on the role of Jarell pit up pit against each other it's that kind of thing that's not really going to happen in a um tabletop role-playing game because it's really that collaborative play right um so even though you've got the dm this is really just the the struggle between two people and I'm going to be like, I'm trying to just create as much tension as I can between them so that no one has any friends anymore after they play the game. Um, but actually, yeah, so that's that's something I just found really inspiring in the story is like, what are the what are the elements that are creating stress? What are the things that I can use that are going to make this fun? But also I want to just I want to keep true to the heart of the story mechanically as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, playing your games, Max, and then reading this, as I said earlier, it's like it's a match made in, I, I guess, hell for this. <laughs> um, it just feel like I said, it just feels right. Like it feels like your um, style of of game and your style of thought with this, you know, uh, Black God versus Jarell um, kind of uh, vibe, um, it, it just works really well together. And I know we've talked about the mechanics a little bit and stuff like that. And I'm super excited to see that. Um, and then the mechanics of the game just in general, like, so we can't do an episode where I don't talk shit about 5e, but I'm trying really hard not to because people, people are allowed to enjoy the things they're allowed to, but people are also allowed to not enjoy things. One of the things in your recent um, update on the Kickstarter, though, that I really, really uh, appreciated and kind of gave me a little bit different perspective is you said about putting them both in the same box as almost a really good intro to people that just play 5e to have access to OSE. They don't need to buy something yeah. separate. It comes with it and you're able, and it's almost like, guys, you know, 5e is not a good introduction to tabletop role-playing games. It's convoluted and complicated and very restrictive. OSE is actually realistically, you know, ar arguably more fun, um, but um, kind of easier to play, like kind of easier to get going in. There's not as much um, just stuff to play the game. So if you have access to both, um, it would be great for a lot of people to be like, all right, we tried 
5e or maybe you want to try this OSE thing. I've run it as this. Why don't I try to run it as that? And I really uh, like and appreciate that aspect of not having buy one or buy the other, get them both, try both. And and being able to introduce somebody with such an amazing setting um, to new games. Was that, obviously that's what you said in the update. Was that yeah. when you first thought of putting them together, the idea? Or was it more kind of pull from both a little bit more? Yeah, so it kind of, the genesis for that uh, came from a few different angles. So one was that, uh, I couldn't decide which one I wanted to write because I was like, we had all right. So we had this great success with Ekphrastic Beasts. There, there are now people interested in Blazing Worlds because of Ekphrastic Beasts and Ekphrastic Beasts is five E. At the same time, I also wanted to try writing OSE. So uh, you know, it's the classic. Why not both? Um, and then thinking a little bit about it more, it just felt like the right. You know, as someone who backs a lot of Kickstarters. Um, I hate making that choice. And I'm like, well, yeah, but like I have this one group that likes to play 5e a lot, but you know, I also want to get more OSC materials or more Morkborg materials or whatever. So just as like a as a consumer of games, I was like, I wish I could just, I didn't have to choose that I could just get a box or a book and it's all there and I then I can decide. And I think a lot of times, um, uh, creators solve for that problem by not put, like having it be like super rules light or no mechanics. And it's mostly just like a source book that like you have to then map to that system or, you know, that they're like, we're not going to put any rules in it. And this is just like some cool ideas that you can introduce into your game. And I didn't want to do that either. I wanted to say like, here are like, here are the we're going to stat the monsters for 5e and then we're going to stat them again for OSE. We're going to like write, we're going to make this table for 5e and we're going to make it again for OSE and do all of that so that it is like low, low effort for the GM or the players to like plug that in. Okay. I um, also think yeah, ahead, function here. follows form in this case. It's yeah. not like a DCC campaign book where it would be impossible to have DCC rules and 5e rules so they have to make when they're trying to repurpose you know uh against the giants like right, you have yeah. to have two different rule books right i yeah. think we have a i think for us this is really about the setting more yes. than any rules at all yeah it's about the setting it's about how to take a setting like this and build in a playable something and so we're not limited. We could have five different rule sets here. Sure. Right. In a way, right? Because yeah. we're not bound by this whole way of thinking about a large scale. Everyone's going to be asking us for more board now, Peter. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but that would be easy <laughs> enough put, to do if this. in the box. <laughs> you know, if we get past all of our stretch goals, that could be a stretch goal. Yeah, right. Right. Our you know? our, our two hundred thousand yeah. dollars stretch goal. I mean, board. you got. Max Max put out what all did Abyss of Hallucination or what all did Jurassic Project come with? It was Merkborg or Fairyland came with Merkborg. It came with um That's not a fair comparison though, because those were inserts. That was a, a totally system neutral zine <laughs> where I did four one page inserts for I'm just for saying the capa the capability is are within the group here to to throw <laughs> yeah. that out yeah. um, and honestly Merkborg realistic and I love the sh I love Merkborg I love the um I love the Stockholm Cartel people and everything Johan is a fantastic human being the game itself is very simple like realistically and that's one of the things that's great about it but a lot of what people love about Merkborg is this amazing vibe that came with it and the world that's built from it which. It's clearly, you know, something that Black God's Kiss is is um, also doing. So Merkborg isn't, it's not DCC, like you guys said. It's not this 600-page rule book that you need to convert something to. The rules aren't, um, they fit across two pages, you know, um, is for the core actual mechanics of the game. Um, so uh, if, if someone does want to convert this, I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's pr it'd be pretty easy on the own. But again, people don't want to put in the work to do that themselves, put it in the box, we get that. Um, one of the things I do want to ask, um, Peter, so uh, if I remember correctly, Jonica said, uh, were you the initial person who reached out to the CL Mora state to, to start with the licensing? And kind of how, as much as I guess you're allowed to say, like, 
how did that kind of process go, like actually reaching out and getting like an IP and, and stuff like that? Sure. Well, I had already had the connection because I had to get the license to publish it in Appendix N. So I had that contact and they were very generous with, you know, uh, allowing allowing me to do that. I mean, you have to, you know, obviously there's some payment that they, they expect. Um, and so it was, it, in fact, that was probably the easiest part of all of this because it was just an email back to somebody I already knew and said, hey, we have this idea. And um, it was almost the same contract spec. I mean, it was, you know, fairly. So so I think we were lucky there. One, that, that I had already had the contact, but two, that they were, they did, the, the Seymour State did not make it difficult for me originally. And then doing this, it, it all, they were enthusiastic about it. They didn't put anything, they didn't put any barriers in our way. They didn't make it cost prohibitive. Um, so, yeah. Which you, which you can't say about all literary estates, by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> well, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the other thing too is like, like you guys talk about on the Kickstarter and you've talked about it a lot, like CL Moore for whatever reason, um, and I'm, I'm, you know, example of that is kind of shunted aside with all these other, I mean, you always hear about Moorcock and Lovecraft and like all these people throughout, you know, these things. And I had never read her. Um, I have a friend, uh, Cersei Victory, who's uh, an amazing creator and writer, who's a huge fan of CL Moore, um, uh, and even has some like the original weird tales and things like that. Um, and when I originally brought up this project in Black God's Kiss, um, he was like, oh my God, like this is amazing this is a huge thing and i was like i've never read it and it's like you have to read it um i, I can imagine the the estate especially if they're so you know are probably kind people but if you got a thousand almost a thousand backers now you're pushing 900 backers with 17 days to go that's like another 900 plus people that may or may not know cl more and you guys are really bringing her a little bit more into the forefront of the current ttrpg space and the consciousness of people that might be into reading her book so i can only imagine that that's a, a potential like a well, I have, them, I, have num I have pretty good information about that, which is that the Boing Boing post about Black God's Kiss Kickstarter, um, the uh, they were able to let us know that they sold because they have the Amazon links. Oh, right. They sold through and copy of that Jarrell collection. Like spelling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and to me, that's really, so that we haven't talked about that part of the box set yet, but what's also included in the box set is the original fiction, that we not only license the IP, but we license the rights to reproduce Black God's Kiss and Black God's Shadow in these like sort of high quality zine booklet type uh, books that we're including in the box. And to me, that's part of you know, we talked about like the conceit behind Blazing Worlds and having it be really artist driven content is that reading those stories is only going to enhance your experience of the gameplay, right? Because as much as we can translate the, the original weird vision onto the tabletop, um, the you're not going to recreate like the atmosphere of the original fiction unless you're just reading the original fiction. So, right. so you're the, the people who get the box set are going to get that work and and that is that is my hope is that you know as someone who comes from a background of literary publishing that they're going to then seek out more of uh cl moore's writing it and it's definitely something we've seen just in like kickstarter comments and people messaging us on social media is like i never heard of cl moore before and now like i'm so psyched i just read the story and like i'm so psyched and so that's really gratifying to me as as a publisher right like whose purpose is to find audiences for work that I believe in that the box set hasn't even been released yet and and we're already like introducing new readers to see on Moore's work. Which is absolutely fantastic. Again, I mean, now I'm going to, I mean, obviously finish reading all of this and hunt out more. So like, again, I'm a product of, or a, a, I'm the target audience here for, yeah. for that kind of stuff. Um, on top of that i guess it's talking about all that comes in the box i guess so as like actually physical things that you get from the kickstarter it's a pretty stacked box so do you want to talk about like all of the things that you could get if you go you know top tier or across the different tiers yeah yeah so i'll just start with the i'll start with the core box which is also mimic, mimicked by the digital pledge level 
So you you would get uh, a book that is the like the sort of what it, what you call like the core setting or campaign book, which is Black God's Kiss. You would get uh, C. L. Moore's um, original Black God's Kiss short story. You would get the micro game uh, booklet that uh, is Max's game, which also comes with a fold out map and some punch board tokens. Um, then when we hit our early stretch goal, that now also includes another book for Black God's Shadow, which is an additional RPG book, and another book that's Black God's Shadow short story by C.L. Moore. So I'm running out of fingers on one hand, but that's a lot of books <laughs> in there. Um, and then, uh, and then if you go up to the deluxe set, the deluxe set also includes another uh, book called Encounter the Architects. Um, and which th this is where we like really we're really taking artistic license here, but there's like one sentence in Black God's Kiss where it references architects of this passage that is the passage that Jarrell travels through from the catacombs of her keep into the into the pocket dimension of the Black God. And so we just let our imaginations run with who are these architects and what do they look like and what's their purpose and everything. So Encounter the Architects is a, is a sort of like a spinoff uh, for that. And then also in the deluxe box, we've got a custom dice, you know, full set of polyhedral dice, and then uh, a resin uh, mini of the Black God itself. Um, and I think mini. Yeah, right, mini, right. So it's scale, it, it's the black god, we can kind of see back here. Um, but it is so if you imagine like Jarrell is scaled to your your standard mini, the black god is scaled appropriately, the black god is perched on a, a tripod of humans. Um, and so if you imagine each human in that tripod is to scale of a regular human mini, that that's how big the Black God mini is. I think it's like 52 or 55 millimeters or something like that. So yeah, it's, I think the Kickstarter page has like 48 millimeters. Yeah, it's it's 48 crazy, millimeters. but yeah. it's like it's at least a like a, a it's a person and a half tall, like slumped yeah. over. Like it's it's right. like a it's got a it's like it's looks chunky. like a paperweight. The thing is chunky. <laughs> yeah. I'm excited for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it looks fantastic. Um, and you did something that I really appreciate on Kickstarters. I do back a lot of Kickstarters. Um, there are some exclusives. Like if you hit yep. the, the Black Odds bundle, I, I, it's, it's great that you guys put the GM screen into like accessible for all the add-ons. Um, but for those who go all the way to the top, um, it's the t-shirt that stays exclusive into it. Yep. And then um, what was the other thing that's just exclusive and there's a, in? And there's, a, and there's a poster too that's like an 18 poster. by 26 poster that that's of this print over here. Um, and so yeah those two like kickstarter exclusive can't get them as add-ons it's just like if you want to be like on the super backer black gods bundle backer you get those um and we had and we had some early bird specials too where like one of the maps that's in the core book that's of the black gods temple that we're printing that as a full size battle map um that those early bird backers get i think we're gonna make that available as an add-on too because you know, it's like you now we're getting messages like, oh, I didn't know about this and I'm just finding out and I missed the battle map and I really want the battle map. And it's like, all right, maybe we'll make that available as an add on. Or something yeah, like I mean, maps are maps are always great for people to, just for playability and stuff like that. Like you don't need the T-shirt to play the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, I'll wear it. You know, you don't need all of those things, but the map, I, that's a, I think that's a great idea is to actually have that in the add-on. Same thing with the GM screen. If it helps run the game, it's right, really exactly. great to have that as accessibility. Yeah. We don't want to um, like, yeah, make it gated for anybody or anything. So, right. Yeah. Um, one question I had, because I keep just ripping off post it notes as I go. Um, obviously, people are reading this now, and I've read it now, but is the story that you're going to get in the, the primary adventure? Um, it's not like it's spoilers to have read the book beforehand, right? It's, it's, I mean, it's a little novella. You know, I assume the world is kind of a little bit bigger than than the story. So um, having uh, read it already, you're not missing out on anything or anything is going to be spoiled for you, right? Does the world expand a little bit more in this? Yeah, I think, I, I, in fact, I would, I don't know, Max, I'd be curious your thoughts. I, I think it would, 
be good for people to read the story before they play the micro game. I yeah. think it will really contextualize the gameplay for the micro game. I think for the RPG setting, it can go either way. Like I feel like people don't have to read it before. And in fact, it might be fun for some GMs to like not show the story to their players before. I don't think there are going to be any spoilers, but I do think that once they've played a little bit in the realm, uh, it will enhance the gameplay to have read the story. Yeah, it's like playing a landmark. Like you, it might be a fun right. to have read the mouser stuff. And right, but you don't have. Playing, to. But you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but the but for the RPG stuff, but it wouldn't spoil it to do. It wouldn't. It wouldn't spoil it, and and so we had to obviously because you're not just like playing Jarrell in the RPG. So we did create it very much a setting. We're designing a number of plot hooks and objectives and and obviously lots of loot uh, for people to find their way into the realm. And actually, Peter, I think that now is a good time to, you know, we were having that conversation the other day about this being sort of like a pocket dimension at the nexus of all worlds. I mean, maybe not, it's not at the center of all worlds, but uh, it's accessible it's, by all worlds. It's accessible by all worlds. And, you know, it's a place where um, people from across time and space uh, can find themselves who are um, interested either knowingly or, or unwittingly uh, in making an infernal pact. Um, and so that really leaves like so many doors open for walking in here. And I, I kind of think of it as like, uh, Ravenloft meets Hellraiser in that way, <laughs> you know, like okay. All right. people, people, people will unlock that, that the Le Marchand's box, the lament configuration, because they're seeking something and then they find themselves encountering these Cenobites or like people walk through the mists, uh, either they're searching for Ravenloft or they accidentally walk through the mists. And so we're creating a lot of plot hooks that way where there might be one where it's very similar to the story and they're trying to like retrieve a weapon of ultimate power and bring it back into their world or maybe they're fleeing something and they flee into a cave and then they find themselves in the realm of the black god and that gives them a tool to bring back you know so there are there are no spoilers there in that regard um, and yeah, one of the things you said, especially in the primary setting, you're not playing Jarrell, right? You're creating characters and then going into this space. But in the micro game, it is. It's Jarrell versus the Black God, right? Yeah. And for the standalone game, to Jonica's point, I, I am designing this for people who have read the story. And you could pick it up and play without reading the story. Um, and that would be okay. There'll be like exposition text and stuff like that. Um, but it really is intended to be like, this is one of the things it's like, I think where it fits nicely into the box set is that you're going to get this box set and you've got your TTRPG content, but we all know how difficult it can be to bring people together. And you're going to want to engage with your stuff, uh, while you're waiting to get everyone together or after you've run some, you're onto a different system or someone else is DMing for a while. Um, so it's this nice way of like, for the folks who are backing this, for those fans of CL Moore who are backing this, and you you picked this up, you've enjoyed it, you've read CL Moore and fall in love with it, this is something where you can play and engage with that content, uh, both solo and two player. So. Yeah, I listen. I can't wait for all of this, and I almost like obviously I want to read it first, but now I'm a little bit sad that I am not the first read isn't going to be the ones that you guys are making because <laughs> is the art in the Kickstarter page? Is that the art that's going to be on the on the um, fiction? Yeah, so there will be um, like the each booklet uh, has a cover illustration um, by Saprofial, uh for the so every booklet in the box has a different color cover illustration by Saprofial. Um, she's also doing interior, either full page or spot illustrations for all of the booklets. And I think there'll be like maybe one or two interior illustrations for the fiction. Um, there'll be a, a lot for the RPG and, and micro game stuff. Um, and, but I think she's also planning on doing one or two interior illustrations for the fiction. I mean, it's all stunning and their art is absolutely amazing. And, uh, Again, after reading it and then seeing the illustrations, it was a great 
a great pick to, to have her do this. I mean, it's exactly kind of how I thought it, especially is specifically looking at the one um, for the fiction that looks like the light tower. Yes. Yeah. Stunning. I mean, I, it's like, how could you draw that? And then they did a great job of actually putting that into this kind of like overwhelming sense of like light, but not light kind of thing. It, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. She's a, she's amazing. She's someone who popped up on my radar while we were doing Encrastic Beasts. And like, I knew at that time, as soon as I saw her work that I was like, I want to, I want to work with her on something. And it was just, and, 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 you know, we exchanged some messages over Instagram and we, and she was also excited. And then I was like, okay, at some point we're going to work on something. And then as soon as it was a go for Black God's Kiss with, with C.L. Moore's literary estate, and I was kind of like mentally scrolling through all the artists I've either worked with or wanted to work with. I was like, oh, Saprofia, so like that, like that, this is the person who can like bring this setting to life and like do that atmosphere justice. And she's been just amazing to work with. Um, and you guys are, I mean, funded like instantaneously on this project, but you're pushing past almost $76,000 now, which yeah. is just knocking down stretch goal after stretch goal. We got coming up is the foil stamping, which is always fantastic. Yeah. Um, and then uh, yet another adventure once the, you know, six digits hits, do you have yeah. plans for after that, if we get that far, or is it kind of like more once core. it drops? <laughs> more yeah, core. there we go. Yeah. Right, yeah. A I mean, thousand and one dollars, Merkborg, we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. right. Um, yeah, so, um, we do have, we do have a stretch goal in mind for, uh, 125,000, um, and I would say like, you know, there are all these like data analytics of how your project is trending. And we're like, within a hair of the trend, we're in like a hair's breadth of 125,000. So there is a chance we'll unlock that 125,000 stretch goal. You never know, like those last couple of days of the Kickstarter can go crazy. Um, so we have like, I, I'm, I'm, waffling back and forth between a couple of stretch goals uh for that 125 and i'm like estimating them with different manufacturers and stuff like that um i'll say i'll i'll, I'll reveal one of them one of the possibilities uh because is would be a Jarrell mini um so uh and that 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 so right now the black god mini is only available in the deluxe set so we would make the Jarrell Mini available in both the core set and the deluxe set, and then only the deluxe set also comes with the Black God Mini. So um, that's one option we're looking at at the 125 mark. Um, there is some other uh, uh, additional content that uh, I need to talk with Peter about before I uh, <laughs> reveal it as a possibility on here. Gotcha. <laughs> Peter's like, oh my God, I'm going to be writing this stuff for like <laughs> next year. <laughs> exactly. yeah. um, and as far as some of the additional content that has been written, like what, uh, what are you guys' um, barring, let's say, you know, the mini is for 125. So kind of like what's out there, including the Escape the Keep. Um, is out there. How far are you guys along the process and, and what do you guys think as far as like when this is actually going to meet people's hands? So um, we are shooting for in people's hands a year after the Kickstarter completes. Um, and that gives us the way that I'm do doing that rough math is that like content is done six months after the Kickstarter completes. And that gives us a six month uh, window for like manufacturing, shipping, and order fulfillment, um, which is pre-COVID times a very generous window. And what I discovered with Ekphrastic Beasts, it, and as like I think every single creator out there on Kickstarter has discovered that like those windows have just stretched and stretched and stretched. And th that's been true in book publishing too. You know, up until COVID, for like the 15 years I was publishing before COVID, I could submit files to a printer and they would ship the printed book to me four weeks later. At one point over COVID, that, that four weeks stretched to seven months. Um, it's back down to slightly more sane lead times now, but I just wanted to build like a big window in for that yeah. uh, 
I'd rather deliver sooner and surprise backers than say we're going to deliver in a year and then a year comes and goes and they're like, where's my stuff? And I'm like, on a, you know, like pallet somewhere in the middle of the country. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but also to mitigate risk, I, I guess it's worth mentioning all the manufacturing we're doing is domestic. It's all within the United States. So uh -huh. I'm not worried about a container ship off the coast of LA coming from China or something like that. Like uh -huh. uh, the box is being printed and manufactured in Tennessee. The minis are being cast here in the US. Um, uh, the only thing is the dice are being uh, created in Europe. Um, but those we can like order as soon as the Kickstarter is done. So I'm not worried about those. As far as content creation goes, um, Max, you can talk about it, but like I already did a play testing with Max in Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago. Um, so it's coming along nicely there. Yeah, we've got a, a nice, uh, I, I printed on cardstock and like cut everything out by hand version. Um, that was super fun. So it's a very, very early draft of the standalone micro game. So lots will change, but it's like the core stuff is there. So play testing is beginning and revising. Um, timing is also great because I just, I literally wrapped up writing for Abyss of Hallucinations last night. So there's still lots to do there, but I get to shift my focus gradually to just really like, Let's take this game now and just like play the heck out of it for a lot of time, rewrite, rework, add. So I'm really excited to be in that phase um, The uh, and to have like sat down and played it a handful of times with people already is just uh, great. So, yeah. Well, if you if you need more guinea pigs, you know where me and Hunter are all the time. So I'll you. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I yeah. want you to play it. Super yeah, excited. Okay. Can't wait for that. And then for the RPG content, like Peter and I have had a number of conversations where we're sort of like building out the scaffolding for the world and the structure. Um, but part of it is that I think we intentionally wanted to get feedback from the community as the campaign is going. Like people are actually asking questions in a way that's very productive for our only own thinking about the game. So we didn't want to like nail everything down before we like the campaign is almost like beta testing and and feature gathering like requirement gathering for for the rpg stuff because we didn't know what the interest level was going to be in each system um you know hearing like people out, like yeah so that it's been really helpful and it's been helping helping to guide our thinking around like what level of play we want to make it and stuff like that so um so the scaffolding's there, but like, and, and some, and we've started like brainstorming hooks and things like that. But um, as far as like the actual like campaign material being written or anything, we haven't we haven't done that yet. Gotcha. Um, and then one other question I meant to ask earlier, but uh, I totally forgot. With with the licensing with CM Moore, I know you you said it was it's pretty easy to get that. Um, after that happens and you guys have that, do you guys need to run any of this by them at all, or are they pretty much just like? You you do what you want. Yeah, we we uh, we do what we want. <laughs> I mean, like we're. I think. Uh, I mean, we'll send them copies of it uh, when it's done. Um, but other than that, uh, and then the license was for a certain print run. So if we if it looks like we're going to exceed that print run uh, based on how the campaign's doing, then we just need to go back to them and pay them more money. But <laughs> that's about it. But again, that's great that that was like one of the easiest parts of the project and that they were so, you know, it sounds like they were so like nice and gracious with with letting you guys just kind of to run with it. So that was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And and the thing that uh, that this uh, this has sort of been like a um, uh, building a playbook for maybe doing this again with with some of the other writers in Appendix N in the future, like there are other stories in, in Peter's anthology that struck me, not in the same way that Black God's Kiss did, but where I felt like, I mean, so many of those stories, you read them and you're like, yeah, like I, I can see playing this as an adventure in my game. And, uh, and so we've talked about like, if this was successful as an experiment, which it so far has been, uh, making a series of box sets where it's like, 
C.L. Moore's Black God's Kiss and then another one by Poole Anderson and another one, you know, like different having sort of like a fantasy masterworks series of box sets or something like that. <clears throat> that that was actually my next question was like, what's on the horizon after this for Blazing Worlds? And that sounds absolutely amazing. I mean, yeah, I don't the, think it'll be that won't be the next one because <laughs> doing this box set has been a lot. Uh, I think I want to go back to just doing a book. <laughs> uh, yeah. so, but uh, but next on the horizon for Blazing Worlds is actually Ekphrastic Realms. Um, so we're going back to the uh, group of creators from Ekphrastic Beasts, and we're creating a source book. So Ekphrastic Beasts is very much a bestiary, a monster manual, and Ekphrastic Realms is going to be like a source book or a fantasy atlas. So I'm taking, we're working with almost all the same original illustrators. I'm adding a number of other illustrators that I'm really excited about, bringing in some other writers and novelists, so I won't be writing the whole thing myself. But basically, <clears throat> each chapter in Ekphrastic Realms will be a realm, however that is defined. So it could be an enchanted island or like a necropolis or a, a, a cursed forest or whatever, a point of interest. And one writer and one artist will pair on like creating 15 to 20 pages all about that, illustrated pages all about that realm. And we'll have... Uh, like I think 10 different realms in the in Ekphrastic realms. Um, is there a possibility for more tastic beasts with that? Yes. Or is that yeah, uh, okay. so it won't be that won't be with Ekphrastic realms, but like more tastic beasts is pretty much like in in the pipeline. Like Good. We, we almost did it before Black God's Kiss. And like honestly, it was just a matter of like which project gained more velocity first and Black God's Kiss gathered the velocity and gotcha. the i was like all right we're doing this now so I've um, had but, sitting next to each other a number of times I'm like no stop just wait <laughs> yeah yeah i mean phil had phil phil already started just doing it for himself he's like i want to play these in workboard so i'm just going to do some of these there you go um, so so yeah i mean and, and that is that is like a pretty lightweight thing i think we just need to decide whether we're going to kickstart it or whether we're just going to like do it and release it you know so gotcha and uh, and Peter, what is next in the pipeline for you after this gets all all done here with Black Ops Kiss? Well, I'll see what Jonica wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait for him to ping me, um, and then I just have my own other uh, research and writing that I'm doing for my other sort of scope of work, as it were. Gotcha. And then Max, I know you recently dropped an update talking about a lot of stuff you have in the pipeline. Did you want to talk about any of what uh, what Max Moon has in in store after after Blackout's Kiss? Sure. Yeah. So one of the things I love doing is just like really small, limited, uh, handmade, weird things. So I've got some of that stuff coming, and I I don't I won't end up like spreading that out too much besides my mailing list because they're so limited but i've i've got um one of the things that's been in the works for a little while we're just slowly going on that should come in the spring probably is uh um the circuit benders handbook for Morkborg, and i'm gonna be chatting with peter a little bit more about this too because i discovered uh peter and i discovered that we have a, a shared passion for the uh the strange electronics I don't know how to phrase it, um, Peter, but uh, yeah, so we're bringing weird noise machines, I guess we can call them. There you go. Yeah. Um, Peter introduced me to the term error, error mancy, and uh, that just like warmed my heart. Um, so the circuit binder handbook will be like a, a morkboard class, but it's going to be some expanded stuff that you can do with it so you can get trashy and make strange noises and scavenge in, uh, I'm saying morkboard, I mean cyborg. Um, in that cyberpunk future, you can get your candy necklace and your garbage speakers and plug in your speak and spell and do some demonic stuff. Um, yeah, that's probably the, the big one we've got coming a little bit later. And gotcha. that's me, Kyle Reimergarten, who did Fairyland with me. That's awesome. Yeah, Fairyland, I mean, all the stuff you do is fantastic, but Fairyland was was a, a thing. I was very excited. I got, again, for those that don't know, I did get the one, 
the one and only copy of the uh, the one and only version of the um, the dark version. So very very excited for that. Um, like I said, Max is a, is a great friend of the show, um, and I uh, and thanks for for uh, reaching out and introducing me to these guys. This has been. Um, fantastic and i can't tell you how excited i am for black god's kiss um and then you know uh hunter as well again uh super sad that he couldn't make it he's at work right now sucks to be you buddy um but uh uh and some other friends as well who are just incredibly incredibly excited about the project this is um a, a, a already an incredibly successful kickstarter especially for someone's like second full ray into tabletop um role playing um can't tell you how excited i am for this is there um anything else you wanted to say about black Ops kids specifically about the project or, or anything no i don't think so we really kind of like checked all the boxes i'm just i'm just like really uh excited and grateful that so many people like jumped on board so early on you know when you do something like this you just never know how it's going to be received. Like you can spend months as a team talking about it and getting super pumped about it and putting a lot of work into it. And then, you know, you can launch to crickets, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so it was just, you know, we kind of like had our launch day and we were all on discord together and we we're like, how is this going to go? And it, and it went really well. And, um, and I'm just like, I'm just really uh, excited to be able to do this box set and to be able to put it out there and that people are are already anticipating it. So, Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, you guys just seem like a really great team. This project just seems amazing. So I can't wait. I can't wait for a year and 17 days so this actually be in the hands <laughs> so we can play it. Um, so and, and, exactly. and there's a very good chance that we'll end up running it here uh, on the Adventure Archive, which would be fantastic. Maybe, Max, we can talk about that a little bit and see what happens there. Um, so uh, outside of obviously Kickstarter, um, I dropped the link a couple of times. We'll make sure the link is up in other places. Where can uh, people find more Blazing Worlds uh, stuff, Jonica? Yeah, so they can just go to blazingworlds.com uh, and uh, and they can order Ekphrastic Beasts directly from, the, from our website. Um, you can get the deluxe edition. We also have a, we also have a, a bunch of copies that have a printer's defect in them. Um, which you can get at like less than 50% off or, or more than 50% off cover price. So if anyone, you know, wants to get that version, they can. Um, but that one's cursed. That one's cursed. So just well, then like... I should have got that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and I guess I'll just also mention if anyone's interested in my own writing, it's just johnnikastuki.com. They can get copies of my books there, some weird occult ephemera. And um, and and also, actually, you asked what's next. Before I do Ekphrastic Realms, I have a Kickstarter launching in October that's a, a live uh, double vinyl LP uh, of a ritual performance I did in Seattle um, with the cellist Lori Goldston. Um, people would know Lori's work from Nirvana's Unplugged album, probably most notably, but she also performs with like Earth and Ohm and some of those bands. Um, and we did a, we did like a ritual performance together in Seattle. So we're doing this double LP. It's coming out on Neurot Records, which is like Neurosis's record label. Um, but we're, we're doing a Kickstarter to just offer some like limited edition swag and uh, some VIP nice. tickets some live performances so that information would be at johnnikastuki.com it's not role-playing related at all um gotcha. but if people if people are interested in that there's a there's a metal vibe overlap there yeah absolutely and uh, and peter where can people find uh your works uh especially like appendix in and things like that yeah so all you know you should be able to find any of the books on wherever you buy books whether it's online <laughs> or any stores can probably order them if they don't um and I'm 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 on all, all the social media, but I'm probably the most active on Instagram. So um, people connect can connect with me there. Gotcha. And then on our uh, Instagram post and, and Twitter, we'll make sure that we have the links to that as well, so you guys can find us at um, the Weekly Scroll for that. And then Max, uh, you, all of your stuff outside of of all the places I already know and your things. Uh, where, where can people find all of your things as well? Uh, MaxMoonGames.com is my um, that's, that's the place. Yep. There you go. Well, it's funny. And then maybe it's not funny. What I, I always search Mac moon games, but I have your, your stuff. Um, uh, uh obviously bookmarked in my things now, but randomly just searched Max moon and did not know that it was a WWE wrestler, uh, which was interesting. 
I eventually plan to write myself up for Neon Lords of the Toxic Wasteland. <laughs> as 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 the WD wrestler, that's fucking that's fantastic. Awesome. Um so yeah, uh check out um Black God's Kiss on Kickstarter. Um it is still 17 days left to go uh for the project. Um again, we dropped the link in the chat. We'll drop the link on all the places that we drop this. Um, podcast and video um you can check us out here on twitch um at uh the adventure archive same as on youtube um on instagram at the dot weekly dot scroll and on twitter where you probably see me talking the most at weekly underscore scroll um we'll continue to push this as we go we did talk about it and went through the entire kickstarter page in our last episode um maybe two episodes ago because it's like our fourth episode this week um so we'll make sure we link that in there um as well and that'll be up on the podcast soon too um, again, thank you guys so much for being here. This is a little bit kind of different than we've done an episode before, and it was it was really great. And again, thanks, Max, for introducing me to everybody. But um, Project sounds amazing. You guys sound like an awesome team, and, and thank you so much for, for coming on the show and being here. Awesome. Yeah, I'm an awesome for the support. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so that will uh, that's me in the other episode, and I'm awful at anything, so I'm just going to say goodbye <laughs> to everybody, and, uh, and we'll see you for our next episode. Have a wonderful day. Take care.